seconds just to give one last set of people. But in fact, yeah, I might as well close the door because uh, that way people think they missed it. And they suck. Rotten people. Uh, thanks for all coming out, by the way. Wonderful to have you here. So. I ask that I give my own introduction because I didn't buy in. Um, I do have an interesting question before I begin, which is how many people here have not played Super Mario 64? So that's about, okay, good half of them. Actually, you know, I, I gave a speech a couple weeks ago about the Atari 2600 and only three of the 20 students had played an Atari 2600. So, you know, it's funny because right now the 30-year-olds are the ones who are kind of in control of initial growing media, and the biases of that show up. So when you, for instance, to, 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 to ask the question, Ginger or Mary Ann, actually puts you into this very unusual age group compared to who you're often selling to. So it's interesting right now to watch as the... Uh, the curve goes. So people make a reference to Super Mario, but when they work on a game like Super Mario and they find out that the game itself has fallen out of interest, um, it can be a little bit shocking. So anyway, good. So there's, there's a group of you who've never played this particular game. Um, I'm going to ask, are there any people who didn't play the game? Are the people who didn't play the game, are there people who played earlier ones, but they skipped this? Okay. All right. So there's a few of those. Okay. All right. So my name is Jason Scott. I run a site called textfiles.com. I co-organize Block Party, and I work on documentaries involving computer history. The reason that interests me is because I myself came through just when home computers hit, and I've taken a real interest in first collecting that history and then spending a lot of time commenting on it. So the general arc of how I've been doing things is first I've been collecting as much interesting stuff, but then I try to turn around and give context to it. This speech is one of those particular context speeches. So people who saw the description in the program and decided to come here, which I appreciate very much, you probably came here thinking, okay, something's going to involve this game, and okay, that's kind of interesting, and Mario's big, and okay, but what, what the heck is he going to talk about? So there is a new field of study that's now up and begun, and it's called platform studies. And platform studies is a different way at looking at online computer history, and what its core thesis is, is that it is extremely hard to understand software unless you understand the platform that the software came from. If you have an emulator, you get a certain amount of knowledge about that game, often its rules, how it sort of looks, but you miss out on other things. And you especially miss out if you don't understand the context in which that game was created. So in platform studies, you end up with a very academic description of games. Now, there's a whole set of questions about whether or not games are even worthy of academic study to begin with. And again, I'm not really here to debate that. The assumption is, is that something that makes millions of people do something is worth looking at. Even if itself, it might be considered facile or not worth your time, the fact that we have millions of people now who play games and you want to understand what effect games have, um, I think it's a worthy worthy field of study. There is an excellent book that I draw from called Racing the Beam. It's by Ian Bogost and Nick Monfort, and it is a study of the Atari 2600 platform. Something that's not a, understood as well now in today's context is that the Atari 2600 video computer system had no video memory. It had no buffer for you to put video images on before they ended up on the screen. You literally were following the beam and sending information out as you went. And you used the period of time in the horizontal blank when the beam on your television would go from here to here to do calculation because the machine wasn't using it. And then when it got to the bottom, it would do more calculation because it would pause for a moment before drawing the next frame. It had 128 bytes of RAM. 
And when you, if you ever know the game Pitfall, um, it's an extremely small number of bytes to store 256 levels of information. So there's all of this work, cases where somebody was able to program it so that you could go from one screen to the next, and then he took a month off of vacation because he had burned himself out doing that. Something that sounds so simple now. So the Nintendo 64 was a mid-1990s platform that came out from Nintendo, who had had previous experience working on uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. This was a company that had been around for 100 years by the time that the Nintendo came out. They started out as a playing card company and moved into all manner of entertainment. Uh, at one point even owning brothels. And they ended up going into electronic games uh, really big in the 70s. And that's where they got Shigeru Miyamoto, who is the creator of what we think of as Donkey Kong. And Donkey Kong introduced, it was basically created because there was a game that didn't sell very well. And they went to him and said, is there anything you can do with this hardware to make the game slightly more interesting and we can send out upgrade kits? And he created Donkey Kong. And Donkey Kong became a runaway hit. In it, there was a character named Jumpman. And Jumpman was essentially what we think of as Mario. But he didn't have a name for a while afterwards. There was a Donkey Kong 2, Donkey Kong Jr., where he was again in it, and eventually we had Super Mario Brothers. Brothers because you needed to have two players, but you didn't want both of them to be the same guy. And there were a number of video games created by Nintendo over the years in the arcade and then later on their home systems using what became a strong branded character, Mario. Mario has had films, books, songs written about him, created every single marketing merchandise, sale, you can imagine there's something with Mario. In other words, by the time we get to 1994, which is when Nintendo has decided they're not going to do uh, an alignment with Sony, and they're going to come out with another system, um, one of the things that's not understood is that the Sony PlayStation was originally supposed to be created by Nintendo. And was a conjunction between Sony and Nintendo. Sony found themselves shut out one day by Nintendo, and they turned around and put the PlayStation out by themselves. Which, uh, again, if you are going back to the first PlayStation, what they now call the PS1, if that didn't do well, Sony would have gone out of business. That's how much they st staked into that. Um, the, the, there was a whole bunch of mechanizations with these consoles by the 90s, where it was a make or break deal. These are enormous, uh, enormous investments of R&D, manufacturing, and, and you name it. They're often sold at a loss, with the idea being that you can make money back on the cartridges. So your software has to be really strong. This is a very, very odd setup. Uh, a lot of what we think of with computer games are different, because there's no real alignment between computers and software makers with the exception of Microsoft on the operating system level. But with applications, applications have some effect but don't utterly drive computer hardware, whereas with consoles, they're completely intertwined. Nintendo also had a very unusual setup. Um, originally, when Atari created the Atari 2600 in the 1970s, which itself was not the first, but it was one of the largest platforms of home video game cartridge-based systems, they attempted to control what cartridges could go on it. And the story as it goes is that David Crane, who had done a number of cartridges for Atari in the 1970s, went to the president and asked if they could receive royalties. And what the president, Ray Kasser, said to him was, you are no more important to the process than the guy who packs the game system into a box down at the factory. So you're not due any royalties. This caused Crane and four or five other programmers to leave Atari and create Activision, whose purpose was to create 
better cartridges for Atari, not constrained by Atari's rules, and sell them on the Atari. Atari sued them and lost. And that's where Atari lost it. Nintendo, however, produced what it called the Nintendo Seal of Quality, a guarantee to the end businesses, the Sears, the department stores, that a game that came from us was going to be good, it was going to function, it was going to be dependable, and it would not violate standards of decency. This was a much more effective way. In other words, other people could create third-party cartridges for the Nintendo, although it was extremely difficult because of these very proprietary cartridges. What they instead really focused on was saying the Nintendo seal of quality will ensure that you get something good. So Nintendo kept this up through all of their game systems. The Nintendo 64 was the next generation of Nintendo's game systems, and they wanted it to make a splash. By the 1990s, Miyamoto is the star creator of Nintendo. His name holds cachet, which is a very unusual situation. There's only probably a couple dozen game designers in history, like Will Wright, where you hear the name and you assume that it's going to be a good game. So by the time we get to the 1990s, it's important to understand that Miyamoto is already a star. Each of these games is an event. It's a movie. And rumors fly about what's going to happen. If he makes a strange comment at a news conference, people go, wait, does this mean this for this game? What about this? He'll drop lines like, oh, I've got this great idea, and I think it's coming soon, or ah, keep, keep track of next fall. And people will react to that. So the Nintendo 64 was, by its standards, a pretty powerful machine with an SGI at its heart. Silicon Graphics created the main chip, and it has a lot of the 3D effects built in. So you have a case where you can do two-dimensional sprites, but you can also do three-dimensional in the hardware. So they wanted to make sure that whatever they did pressed this 3D ability, that you wanted to know you'd get 3D with this Nintendo work. And as people have now discovered with the Wii, which is a more contemporary thing, Nintendo prefers to lag in terms of technological advance and trade off for it a dependability and a cheapness of the console. And this turned out to be really working out in their favor with the Wii selling much more than anyone would have ever dreamed of when it came out because you end up with a system that changes paradigms. So if you want to reel back to this one, this is the Nintendo 64. By this point, they have the Mario brand, they have um, Zelda brand, they have a whole series of games. And they wanted to make sure that this game, a Mario game, was there on the first day. Miyamoto has been given all of this time to work on Mario ideas. And while he was working on the Super Nintendo, he had some ideas of how to do a, a whole new approach to Mario games. But there was no way for the Super Nintendo to dependably put this out. So he um, works differently than a lot of designers. He tends to work on multiple projects at once. During the time that he was working on this, he was assigned to run four different projects. Um, he was given a dedicated team of 15 people to work on it, and they were given essentially two and a half years. So the game itself is an extension of the Mario universe, which is an organically grown design universe with very odd things. It's basically got components of there's a little guy who looks like a plumber, and he runs around, and when he jumps on something, it crushes and he gets points. There are coins floating everywhere, and there are all sorts of strange named things, all in the pursuit of a really standoffish girl in a pink dress. So when they designed the system, they were given, again, this was a man who had the power to change the platform to his specifications. He had the power to ask for additional things. I worked on the Sony PlayStation to a small extent for a software developer. Somewhere around the, oh, about a year before it came out, Sony let us know um, that it was not going to be eight megabytes of RAM for development uh, in the actual machine. It was going to be two. Great cost-cutting measure, but an awful lot of developers found themselves 
really caught out. And I do want to mention one other badass group. There's a game out there called Battle Arena Toshinden, which I fully understand if you've not heard of. It's basically a fighting game. Two characters on a disc beat the living crap out of each other until you win. That group who designed it, if you ever see this game, realized they had no development tools. They were not given an API. They were not given a compiler. They were not given anything but the hardware. And they reverse engineered it and figured out what byte codes did what and created the game from scratch, given no help from Sony. So when you see that game, realize they learned how sound worked. They learned how graphics worked. Luckily, most of these systems come with development consoles where you get a PC, which is what they had, a PC connected to an SGI that they could use a keyboard and do control. So this was a keyboard game in development before it became the final controller set. The controller introduced a few new ideas, an analog stick along with a digital directional pad and a Z button, which is a trigger underneath. And it was a very odd shaped console, which I'll hold up right here. Um, so you basically had this very, very odd thing, which was designed so that you could hold it with two or this way, or this way, depending on what game you had. You had directional pads on both sides. It was a very strange piece of work because it was designed in so many ways to have triggers and consoles of all sorts. And a lot of it is affected by Miyamoto's desire to have Mario do certain things. So this team worked really hard on this game. And they wanted it to be the first real, there were some pseudos, but a real Mario 3D platformer. A format which now we're very used to. The idea of a character running around in 3D is not a selling point, per se. You, you very rarely see games say 3D at the end of their title now, because it's not a selling point anymore. Now it has to be something else. But this had to say, Super Mario 64, i.e. I'm 64-bit, and it was going to be a 3D platform. So when you first boot in the cartridge, this is what you get. You get a 3D generated Mario in an amazing polygon count, fully reactive with lights being shown. So this is an ad for the game you're about to play. This says basically, look, it's got amazing backgrounds, and you're going to be able to get lights that are realistic, and it's just telling you, just press start, just start this game. As an additional piece, if you take the joystick, you can actually maneuver him. So there's a MIDI demo by being able to make that happen. And this is the game itself. I'll start the game up very shortly, because I think it's important to know how seminal a work this was. They were not just taking a beloved character where any screw-up could result in the brand being diminished but they were trying to introduce an entire new generation of people to the idea of 3D. And how would you do that? So what they started with was they just started with a grid. And this is where I want to say, this is why I wanted to give this presentation, because you will find yourself in the future, if you work in development, or you work with people who are in development, or doing user interfaces, or doing anything where other people have to use your new crap, you have to sell your own program to the people who come in. We have too many people who work on awesome engine cores that go out to three wires, two of which shock you. And that's good for prototypes, but understanding that people work that way and what you have to do to bring people up, and you look at it with a company like this that essentially said, do what you need to do to sell this product, that's where you start to see some really interesting ideas. Um, so they work really, really hard. They worked really, really hard on the realism, or I should say the consistency, of the Mario character. They had a grid, and it was just a grid. And later they added little trees, which they called a garden. And they spent months perfecting just Mario running around. Can we make him run around? What does he do when he do this? If we pull this trigger, does he react correctly? How do we make him jump? Just to make it work. Then they added water. What happens with water? So they had a little water in the corner. In other words, without thinking about levels, without thinking about the end boss, without trying to figure out if we we're going to have something with 
snow, or we're going to do this. And instead of focusing on things like, oh, this is a nice snow effect, and this is whatever, all they said was, at its core, does it work? And it was something they've done with Mario Galaxy, which was the most recent in the series. They spent month again retuning. How do we make this work? How do we make this work? In today's era, um, we wouldn't think about something like camera control. But camera control here is a processing nightmare. How do we introduce camera control to people? And the way, I'll show you how they do it in a moment, but they anthropomorphize the camera so that you would think of the camera as a person. And it had a separate set of controls so that you could affect things. So um, let's start with just how this game goes. So let's pot up the sound. So as a player, you're playing this game, and you press start, which I am. OK. You're given the razor-thin plot. Where the razor thin plot is, Peach. Princess Peach wants you to come to have a cake. This character is anthropomorphized with a camera, and it shows him coming in to this place. With beautiful music, you are shown this castle. You are brought around underneath, above, to explain to you this is a 3D world. It's got water, it's got trees, it's got sky. You are going to be able to move around, and then from out of it comes a 3D Mario announcing himself to you. <laughs> and now you are here. It thanks you for coming, tells you about your two commands, A to jump, B to attack, and then says, by the way, you can read that sign. And this is it. You could stay here forever. You could never move. And all that would happen is after a while, that character would yawn and fall over and go to sleep. In other words, the game gives you absolutely no pressure. Instead of assaulting you, it moves to placate you. You see a beautiful waterfall. You hear birds. It's a quiet, gentle place. He's getting tired. But there he goes. So again, you're rewarded. If you're stunned and you're an older person or a younger person, you just watch it, it rewards you. They thought out far enough for you to just sit there and enjoy what's going on and be amused by it. We'll start him up. When he runs around, again, they worked really hard, so you'll see that he's sliding. And in this world, you can try to run up things, and it lets you go. If you look over here, just butterflies. You can't affect them. It just demonstrates to you that this thing has so much processing power that they can afford to have butterflies. You can see them run on their own, do things. And again, you're sitting in a very subtle way, you are shown the power of the graphics chip. Moving up and down. Again, no pressure. You can jump up and hit a tree. And make him stand up. When he runs, pressing the buttons multiple times. Now, that works from the first moment you start the game. It doesn't tell you about that till later, when you need to reach it. But it's there, if you need it. If you press this trigger at the bottom, he crouches. And if you press the thing, he crawls. So you press the trigger, and he flips. In other words, an extremely complicated language of expressing yourself through this thing. Now, on a technical level, just so you understand, these trees are actually 2D sprites. So it's actually trying to save processing power. That's why whenever you move with them, they're like the eyes that always follow you. They never actually do anything. If you walk over to something like this sign, it'll tell you, oh, you can climb trees. You can do this. Why don't you try this? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can do cool yeah. stuff. Now, I always forget where it is. Whoa. I think it's the next one. Let's try it. One of these trees contains a mushroom. Whoa. 
and a mushroom gives you a free guy. In other words, if you leave and come back, every time you come back, yeah. you get a free guy. If you have the patience, you can play forever. There's no constriction. In other words, arcade games where you are told that you can't lose your three guys and you have to stop and go away, they've removed a lot of that from the home console. They don't pressure you. Now, there's an interesting actual glitch effect. Um, when you set off that mushroom, that mushroom comes to you, and the programming is open enough that it tries to find you. Now, I just stood there and got it. But there are actually levels out there you can see on YouTube where someone gets the mushroom and blows themselves across the level, and you watch this terrible mushroom move through everything, go through enemies and everything to track you down, and they can keep it going for 15 minutes. Again, what I think I'm trying to get across here is you are literally in a beautiful garden, yeah. and you are given all of the opportunity to see what this machine can do. So you're being told about the 64, and you're being told what the game will kind of be like. Yeah. In the water, if I do this right, I can kill him. But it's it takes effort, and it really doesn't want you to get killed too quickly. So you've got to really work at it. It's much slower than it normally is. If you look, it's really taking the time. And here's a grating. What does that grating do? I don't know. What does this go over here do? You move along, and if you look up, which is not obvious right now because you haven't learned the controller thing, there's two coins. Only time you see coins in this level. There they are. And the question becomes, why are there coins there? How can I get to those coins? I don't have a chance of getting those coins. I can do something. I could try to jump, move. What do I do here? Can I get it? In other words, you are presented with a gentle but relevant puzzle, which you may or may not be able to solve. There's also a beautiful little grating here. So, again, you have somebody who comes along and says to you, Hi, I am a reporter who has a camera, and I am going to follow you to tell your story, which you are going to create. And so moving around with your camera, which you've now been introduced to, allows you to see things from your point of view, from a back point of view, and you can maneuver the camera as you go. If you look on the bottom right, there's a Mario cam, there's a regular cam. In other words, the system is trying to teach you a pretty complicated concept by giving you a forward-thinking, easy-to-understand allegory. This is very useful for you if you're creating something and you want to get people the idea. If somebody's faced with a screen full of text, that says certain things, which is like the programmer is an automaton robot I should ignore. But if you have somebody who says, well, here's an example of it demonstrated. Even if the movie is stupid, I'm even tired. if you oh, shut yeah. up. So when he walks in, it just puts him in. And you're faced with this problem. I don't want to go too far into this game. There's a couple things going on here. There's just a little friendly guy. And the, uh, it, this is actually an artistic rendering of a Mario level. In other words, you have a reference to the old days, but it's laid on top of. So in other words, you reference the old thing. This is something where you might see a, 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 a modern uh, program which has an 8-bit feel in portions of it, just to give you a sense of where, what came before. Um, here he has the ability to run upstairs. He has the ability to jump off of things and all of them harmless. And you get introduced to this ability, which is the ability to bounce off the walls. And um, not to give a spoiler away, but it is possible to look up here. And later in the game, if you do that, you go to a new level. And this is my favorite part of the Mario. And this is something I love in terms of games. And there's only a few games that do this. 
Most games are extremely linear. You end up in this level, and the level is a castle. And then you go to the next level, and it's a haunted house. You go to the next level, and it's a mushroom. And then you go to the next level, and it's a slide. In other words, everything is painted as a disposable world that you move past to move on. In this game, you, re you will return to this location easily a hundred times, and you will do it with new contexts provided to you, new abilities, new places. Things will move. The water outside will drain and give you access to new places. You gain new contexts for the world that you live in each time you return. I think this is a wonderful thing to teach children, but very, very, very few games do it. Most games now teach you that if you run really fast, you can kill a lot of people quickly. And that's the primary lesson. And also, if you trash talk people, they'll get really mad and play worse. But you don't tend to have cases where there's a learning curve, even if it's within this relatively you know, constricted world. This game has a number of things that go on with it where, for instance, you can't go here because it's some sort of lock. And it tells you that. But to give an example, over here, it's got a single star and tells you that, that something's here. And if you walk up to it, it shimmers. Visually, it tells you there's something weird going on here. Now, here, it's got instructions which are boring, but you can do that. In some of these locations, there's places, if you run around these rooms and go to unusual corners, you will discover things. In other words, there's an explicit reward system for not just going for the basic thing. And I think a lot of people who were raised on these games will turn around and make games and environments where you walk into the room and there's some flaming pile of shit on the other side, and you know the entire context of your environment is to attack the flaming piece of shit. There's no meaning except to, to stage the shit. You don't have any insight into anything around the location. Its entire purpose is window dressing. And you learn to ignore, 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 get to the point. Whereas in this game, you are rewarded. Another maneuver they do is that you are given stars. You are trying to collect stars. There are 120 stars in the game. But all you need are 70 to win. In other words, if you face up against things that you don't understand, instead of being endlessly frustrated and not getting to the next portion of the game, you can choose something else. To hardcore gamers, this is all anathema. This is terrible. These are things that aren't good. The game should start with it beating the crap out of you so you learn your lesson that life is terrible, brutish, and short. You're not going to get anything on your own, and you should kill, kill, kill. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is captured in, for instance, the Halo series, which has less, it actually has a negative plot. It actually has a plot that causes you to understand the world less the more you enjoy it, because less and less makes sense as you go on, until eventually there's no sense, and it's just you. Well, with this particular series, there's a sense of context. Now, I'm just going to, just for a moment, go into the actual level, just to show you. You're shown a star, it's empty, that means you might want to get something, it's a course, it says one. An advantage of the cartridge system is instantaneous loading, which we're getting away from nowadays, but this is, you know, everything is optimized to give you maximum loading. It tries to explain things to you, and all these friendly guys are part of your world, and you're again, now you've got music, you've got the ability to run around, this huge area here lets you feel safe. Nothing will come attack you while you're over here. And there's a, a, a cannon, and you don't know why, and there's things going on. And over here, it's another little play space. It says, oh, you know, if you go over here and grab this, you can run along and jump with it. And if I do it right, you get a reward. So again, you end up with more learning. The game is a constant process of learning. Once you learn your basic things in Halo, you can shoot, you can run, you can flip. When you die, you end up not having to learn a whole lot later. This game is a constant set of learning. Um, 
I don't think there's much, I mean, you know, this is essentially Mario. Go away. And... Go up to this. Um, comparatively, now bear in mind, this is a four megabyte game. So this is all fitting in four megabytes. And it is huge. Can you pop down? Um, so this game is huge. They wanted to have 40 courses. They settled for 15. But the 15 courses end up providing you 120 stars. In some of them, you have to go back to the same level that you're in and find all the red coins. In other words, now you have to explore every piece of it to find it. Okay, these, are, these are all aspects of not just Mario. But this is a way of looking at life. This is a way where you are encouraged to move around and explore. And we're moving more and more towards this bizarre balance between hardcore gamers and people. People who play games, every, and, and bear in mind, this isn't just gaming, right? I mean, I know very well from hardcore gaming from my studies in text adventures from the 1970s and 80s that they started to run into this terrible loop that their most vocal uh, responders and critics were people who played these games to the hilt until they were no longer functioning. They were games designed for such a small group of people with so much backstory required that only a person who knew and had gone up through the environment was properly evolved as a human being to play this thing. Shutting out, rightfully, you know, it would be bad if they painted that it was for everyone, but rightfully shutting out everybody else who would want to be new to the game. And if they did anything to modify it, they would end up shutting out the hardcore gamers. Nintendo has said in multiple times, especially now with the introduction of the Wii, a philosophy which shows itself in this game, we want more people. The only way for this industry to expand is for us to allow everyone in. You should never feel that you're shut out, that you can do it. The game should make itself easier. There's um, a uh, rather controversial idea called Elastic AI. I don't know how many people know about that. Elastic AI is basically if you have a game which has a bunch of people in it doing something and one player is really kicking ass, it quietly makes that person suck. So you'll play a racing game. Sega Rally comes to mind. Mario Kart comes to mind. If you are just toasting your friends, your engine won't work as well anymore. And it's very quiet. It just quietly makes you suck a little more, a little harder. It makes you drive a little slower. You can't do turns as easily. It becomes harder to drive. And the people who are not playing well, who are at the end, become progressively better. Their engines get faster. They're able to take turns easier. It helps them along because the important thing to them is not the contest rules being followed, but that everyone have a good time. And it is a philosophy that is different than something like a modern system of multiplayer where the purpose of the game, and I do believe this is really what we're ending up in. In fact, I'm going to diverge again to tell you the story of the chickens. They were talking about one of the things that caused Enron to happen. And one of the things that happened with Enron was Enron had a very, very tough retention policy. Um, if you underperformed, the lowest 10 or 20% of underperforming traders would be fired. This was meant to cause better traders. Similarly, we had, with what we now call Petaluma chickens, a, um, a breed of chicken that was bigger, more meaty, juicier. And we have used that chicken to the modern era. This is the chicken most of us eat when we eat chicken. But it had been bred, they thought, to be tastier. What they actually were doing were they were breeding meaner chickens. The chickens that were meaner, that were more likely to go for the feed, that were more likely to attack other chickens to get the most feed, got bigger while the other ones got smaller. And these were the assholes chosen to be the next generation of chicken. <laughs> Until we ended up in an era of chickens that are now routinely de-beaked to prevent them from attacking each other because they come out of the egg pissed. <laughs> Similarly, Enron 
by instituting this policy, did not produce better traders. They produced sociopaths, people who were more than willing to do anything it took to hit metrics. So when you do things like selective breeding or selective analysis, you end up causing, often, unexpected side effects. And what we are producing now is we are producing a generation of gamers who understand that the more you fuck with the system, the more reward you will get. The more that you figure out that by not playing this way, but by playing a way antithetical to how the game was designed, that is a reward in itself and will result in you getting higher accolades and getting a better score, regardless of whether or not you enjoy it. And there's not a whole lot of design work put into that yet. They try to stop cheaters. Um, an example of that is the recent understanding that there are utilities for Halo which can tell you what the other player's IP addresses are. And then there are by the hour botnets that you can rent with an integration into this utility so that for $10 you can knock off every other IP that's playing against you. Okay? This is a case where the reward system, while it may seem strange that someone would want to win a game that badly, it's part of, to me, a reflection of the design and what the design is pushing. So I think it's something that's important to understand when you're doing design, is that, for instance, if you design a really complicated application, you are breeding for very self-directed, unsharing assholes who will understand your application just enough to keep their jobs doing it. There are, as we all know, many programs where just the art of understanding how to interface with the program represents a barrier to entry, preventing other people from having that jobs. Uh, DBA comes to mind, where a database administrator must keep their own lives at bay with their own conventions and their own language because the system is so needlessly complicated that it ends up ensuring stability at the price of integration. So it ends up becoming black magic, something we really tried to move computers away from. The revolution that happened in the 1970s with home computers, which like I said was a very important time to me, is that representation. There was a period of time in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when the country seriously looked at the licensing of the usage of computers. We seriously looked into the potential that you could only touch a mainframe if you had a license. And the home computer re revolution proved that you didn't need to do that. You could just give these things to people, and they could do things with them. And that's how we ended up where we were. So the lessons that I see from Nintendo are in that way legion. And I think it's really worth it to play it, even if you've got to play it on an emulator and pull it up. It's worth it to go through this game to really see how that sense of exploration constantly drives you into being a better person than being a better gamer. Now, make no mistake, the game is difficult in places. It's a hard game. It encourages places where you are miserable trying to figure out how to make everything work but you don't have to be miserable. And you, you learn things, and you find secrets, and you get a reward system that I don't think we see in a lot of today's world. So I think this is one of the most important events in game console history. We look at it now with jaded eyes, and this is the danger of computer history. But I really think that the watershed of Super Mario is something that we can really, really learn from. And I really encourage people to look into these older games, especially ones that the time uh, past has only made them more admired. Uh, I still find times when I'll start to play this game for fun, just to see things, and I find myself totally immersed in it for hours on end. Um, there is a whole metric of people who can do speed runs. Um, over the years, people discovered glitches in the system. And one of the things they discovered was that there was a trick called the bunny trick. And there's a bunny in the game, and you're supposed to catch the bunny. And it turned out that if you caught the bunny, and you walked over to a door, and you held on to the bunny, and kept holding on and closing and letting go of the bunny, it would, go, it would push you through the door. 
Now try to imagine how many man hours that took to discover. <laughs> many games must contain glitches like this, but something about Mario makes people come back and say, can I do this, can I do this, can I do this? As a result, it was possible to solve Mario in 16 stars. Later, somebody figured out how to solve it in one star. And there is currently a glitch, which I was thinking of playing for you, but you'd be completely nonplussed, where you can solve it in zero stars. You can just walk in the goddamn door and win. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, basically the idea is there's a bug in the game where, and, and it, it has to be tool assisted, essentially. You have to, um, you have to really jam the controller. But if you, you take this poor little guy and you throw him up against a wall and really jump him really fast, the game will glitch and send him going backwards through doors, through enemies, through everything. And somebody figured out how to do that to shove him backwards through everything with no stars. And again, this came out two years ago. So somebody played this game now and did this. So this is, you know, the, the tool run, the tool is very interesting because it's our modern eyes looking back at this work. And again, this came out in 1996. So it's essentially been 13 years since we've seen Mario, which is why I understand why some of you have not played this particular game. Um, we are currently in a very interesting wave of the last five or six years towards nostalgia for these games. But I think way too many times, bringing us back to platform studies, we look at them merely as, merely, merely as works of art, background dressing, or interesting um, uh, nostalgic icons to point at and go, Super Mario, cool, and move on without really understanding why did Super Mario stay where he is. And so I encourage you to play the game. I encourage you to look into Racing the Beam by Nick Montfort. I encourage you to spend a little time and realize where we came from because I think it will help you in knowing where we're going. Thanks a lot. How much... We probably have time for like one or two questions if people have them. Anybody have a question? All right, you got a question, I'll get to you. Right, okay. I mean, in terms of the intro, okay, so the introduction of Easter eggs or what? Like, no. In terms of like what? Like, in, I think you just, there is a moment where you introduced this idea that, um, that developers were making games that were catering more towards exploring environments as opposed to necessarily traditionally playing through them, right? right? Going through a traditional narrative, right. right? And I was wondering if you think that is not only, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not that's only based on developers. Like, I guess from, from a game player perspective, I think it's also it's something to recognize. Okay, I'm probably gonna tangential on it. And, that's fine. And, and starting a question with me, could you briefly, is really dumb of anyone who knows me. Um, it's like going to a, like a, I don't know, like saying, can you quietly? Um, but, but, okay, well, okay, there's always been this kind of a tension between the idea of a game and an educational game, right? Traditionally, educational games are a terrifying, miserable ghetto of depression because <laughs> they're designed with a fear instead of a joy. They're designed with the fear that you will fuck up a kid and be arrested. If you don't put forward the right lessons, if you don't paint the things right, if you don't make the character, does that character look too much like a weird race? Does that character not say this? Does violence work when it shouldn't? In other words, there's always this sense of fear. 
And with games, it's more a case of what can we get away with, what are we doing, what will excite them. So you're more working on like what can we get up here and then we'll cut off the crazy edges. Um, a good example to me is um, the Postal series. Um, because the Postal series really was, its main pejorative is to, is to shock. And so how can we shock people? And so, so there's a whole bunch of that. And so when it comes to things like education, I think with Nintendo, they um, have always kind of put forward these ideas. In other words, um, Mega Man is just meant to be more of an arcade-ish game. Whereas um, a Zelda or a Mario are meant to have these exploratory aspects. And I think the education comes from that. In other words, I don't think even Nintendo thinks of their games as educational. I do. But I think it's like a lot of times when you're a developer, if you try to say, and in other words, do you focus on its good music or do you focus on its good music and it, it elates people? If you're trying to design music that elates people, what you end up doing is you go back and go, what other music sounds elation-like? And you integrate it. So it ends up becoming, wow, if I just stick in a few keyboard pads and just kind of let things run off in a dreamy sequence, I've made an elative work. So it's like, okay, at some point, the character has to instruct you on things. Therefore, it's educational. It should have a series of facts that you should have to answer. That's educational. In other words, I think it's more of a case of going, how, when I create this, how do I bring people with me? How do I do it? And I think education is one of those tools. That's more of what, where I go from. So I think it's more of a tangential thing. I think, it's like, I think education is a primary component, just like enjoyment, ease, or anything else is a component. Um, I think you can, people catch on when you just do cynical integration of a feature set. They just know it. You know? They're like, OK, here's the party's making me do this. I got to sit through a cutscene. Cutscenes are a good example, right? The narrative diarrhea of games because you end up stopping the game because you have to make a movie and then you end up making a game after it. There's no sense that the movie is part of the game. Um, I find it very exciting. You have some games where somebody comes up and talks to you like a cutscene and you can leave. You know? I, in fact, I can actually boil it down to one of my friends who used to play racing games. Um, very self, we'll use the term self-directed person with him. He's a really good friend, so I'll say self-directed. But he, if you sat him in front of a racing game, first thing he would do is try to turn the car around. If you couldn't turn the car around, suck, you stop playing it. Because it meant that they had geared everything for that. And there was no sense of exploring. There was no sense of like, well, what can I do next with this awesome thing? Oh, I can't turn around. What's behind me? Now, obviously, at some point, there's a, uh, you know, earlier games have a technical issue. But later games, there's no excuse. It's just them doing it just because that's what they think you're supposed to do, and everything feels like you're stuck on a, billion, a billiard ball going down a... So there's no sense of, like, what's up, what's going on, what's going on. There's no reward for stopping. We've gotten a little better with that. Some console games, like, you take the cars and aim them at people, and the people don't just sit there going, yay! You know, that you have this, there's one Microsoft game where, like, people, like, get the fuck back. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're nuts! That's kind of a good experiment. And obviously, I mean, there's the whole Grand Theft Auto thing. Although, again, another murder simulator. You had a question? Yes. Oh, Ted, you're so cute when you shuffle. I was curious your thoughts on how much the, the game renaissance has been brought about by the Wii and specifically the game store. Because, you know, PS, the PlayStation line had, you know, backwards compatibility. But now with the Wii, you can basically get access to close to their whole archive or they're, they're getting there. So it's a lot easier to play something like Super Mario without needing to actually go out and buy the console. You can just go download it, start right. playing it. I'm going to answer that very quickly because we're at uh, three minutes left. Um, yeah, okay. So one of the things about the Wii and the PlayStation and everything else is, wow, we can take these old dead properties and hump them into further profitability. And there's variant states of that. Like some of them just throw it on with no sense. Nintendo actually play tests them all the way through on the new hardware to make sure they work. And they do a lot more effort to that. And it's been interesting because it's it has caused, I wouldn't use the term renaissance. I would use the term expanded field. Like it's, it's a reaction to the emulator craze where it turned out, I mean, a lot of these places didn't realize that people still wanted to play 20-year-old games. And, if you, and then, of course, you end up with idiots who's like, well, if you want to play the old game, let's charge the old retail rates for the game. Not really understanding that it's like, no, I just want to try it for a while. Um, so putting a game out for 99 cents that used to go for $35, I mean, this was a $60 game, 
you end up bringing in a whole but a bunch of people in a little burst, and people might learn something new. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, on the flip side of it, it's kind of a bummer that we're now training a new generation of people not to own what they buy. But OK, fine, whatever. You know, there's, that's, a whole, that's, that's far outside of the, you know. I mean, you know, because you've got to say, like, on one, sense, on one sense, we can always talk to our children because they have cell phones. On the other hand, our children are sticking transmitters one inch from their heads. And we can all have a great time saying, everything shows this isn't going to hurt us. But that's what they used to say about dropping DDT on beaches. You know, so it's like we're taking a risk, but we really like it. <laughs> we really like it. Um, so we don't know. I mean, you know, uh, um, this whole generation now that's so used to just saying, oh, well, here's $5 for a thing, and I'm never going to have it again. It's, when we've now turned games into food. OK, all right, well, you know, we'll see how that really bums out. But I'm really happy about the fact that you can go to a system now that was created now, press a few buttons, and be transported 20 years into the past. So yeah, for that. So the next person is like, what the hell is he still doing on the stage? So thanks again, everyone. And be at block party tomorrow, man. <laughs>